Hi there, this is Toby. I found that the most popular videos on my channel are the ones having to do with compilers. I have the Make Your Own Programming Language series, the LLVM Tutorial Walkthrough series, the Live Code Make a Programming Language from Scratch series, and the original How to Make a Programming Language series. I've put a lot of work into these and um, they've gotten fairly good reception, I would say. One example is someone from Tunisia, a uh, student uh, graduating from computer science, uh, used my videos to teach him how to make a programming language as his senior thesis for graduating. And that was extremely gratifying. While many have benefited from these videos, um, they do have their limitations. First of all, it doesn't come anywhere close to being complete. There are many concepts in compilers that I have simply not covered. But another limitation of these series is, is that they are too monkey see monkey do. The viewer usually ends up simply copying the code that's being written in the video. The leading literature in educational psychology research has taught me that the more you think, the more you learn. And that means that if you really want to learn something, you want to do the problem solving on your own rather than just follow somebody else's lead. Another problem with the tutorial format is that you tend to focus on what is the right way to do things. When in reality, there is no one right way to do things, but rather you can make alternative choices at every turn. A tutorial does not have room for comparative analysis of alternate approaches. For those reasons, I'm starting a new series for compilers. The Compiler's Challenge, where a problem will be presented to you. You will problem solve, because as you know, problem solve is a verb. And then in a separate episode, my solution will be presented. I recommend that you don't look at my solution until you've had a faithful attempt at solving it yourself, because that would kind of be like seeing a spoiler for a really good show. You may use any programming language you'd like to solve the problems. Uh, they are really completely language agnostic. I will tend to use Python for my solutions because Python is my favorite language for teaching and also I will have my own Python debugger at my disposal. I plan to make many compiler challenges from here on out. Here are some of the topics that I have marked down on a handkerchief. I have also created a Discord channel where you can chat with me and others like you in real time. You can join us via this link. If you're new to compilers or how to make programming languages, I recommend you watch this video first, entitled, What Does It Mean to Make a Programming Language? Uh, this video will give you a high level structure of what are the different parts in a compiler, which is the thing you would be making if you were to make a programming language. It'll show you the different parts, how they fit together. It'll give you a map. So watch this and then come back to this series. For the first compiler's challenge, we're doing the reverse Polish notation. Uh, reverse Polish notation is a different way of notating arithmetic operations where the operator comes after the operands, as you can see here. Uh, the, the reverse Polish notation is also referred to as the postfix notation, which is in contrast to the infix notation which is the style that you would be familiar with, where the operator goes into the middle. There's also the Polish notation, where the operator goes in front before the operands. So we have the normal kind of notation, which is called the infix notation. We have the reverse Polish or postfix, where the operator goes after the operands. And now we have the Polish or prefix where the operator goes in front. Why are we doing this? Well, um, the Polish notation and the reverse Polish notation, these are ways of expressing language that compiler theorists tend to really geek out about. So I thought we would start off on the right foot with the first challenge. Many compiler theorists, for example, are really into the Lisp programming language. And uh, if you've seen Lisp code before, you would notice that it is written in the Polish notation style. That's not what we're doing today, though. We're doing the reverse Polish. And 
The reverse Polish notation is notably used in the fourth programming language. So, so this is some fourth code. And this line means uh, take the numbers 25 and 10 and multiply them together and then take the result and add it to 50 and then print it and uh, put, put the carriage return after it. That's a line of fourth code. There's a video on YouTube which shows off an HP calculator which can do reverse Polish notation. Um, this kind of calculator was actually popular in the 70s and 80s and notably it's actually more efficient uh, from the user perspective for doing long calculations. So if you're interested in that, you can watch this video. I do not own this calculator, but I do have the calculator app on the Mac, which supports the reverse Polish notation. Uh, you can see that the reverse Polish notation mode, RPN, uh, has been turned on. To show you how to use it, let's first do a simple calculation, such as 3 plus 4. Uh, first, we would rewrite it in reverse Polish, and which would look like 3, 4, plus. With this calculator interface, what you would do to, to um, distinguish 3 and then 4, distinguish that from 34, is you would type enter after typing 3. And then you type 4 and then plus, and then it will do the calculation. So let's do that. So 3, enter, 4, and then plus. And now we have the calculation. Uh, let's take a closer look at what happened there. So after we hit 3 and enter, you notice there's an extra 3 up here. Um, and what's happening is there's actually a stack being created here. This is a stack of numbers. And currently it has two numbers in the stack. Um, this is actually the bottom of the stack. And this is actually the top of the stack. The stack is flipped. So the bottom thing is actually <laughs> the, the top or, or the first item of the stack, if you will. So new numbers go in visually from the bottom, but we call it the top. Okay, so um, when we hit 3 and then we hit enter, what it actually did is push the current number, or the number on the top of the stack, 3, down, so that we have a second 3 over here. The original 3 is retained just so that you can sort of overwrite it with the next number that you want to be the top of the stack. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to type 4 and then that overwrites the first entry in the stack. And, and so now when two numbers are in the stack, we're ready to do an operation uh, by pressing an operator. And then what plus does is take the top two items, uh, use them as the operands to the operation, do the operation. Um, it will take those operands off of the stacks, and then the result would be put back onto the stack. Thus, we end up with uh, just the number 7 on the stack at the end. Let's do a slightly more complicated example. So let's do 3 plus 4 times 5. First, rewrite it in reverse Polish. That would be 4, 5, because we have to do 4 times 5 first. And then 3 plus. So we'll do 4. Oh, let's clear this first. So we'll do 4, enter, 5 times. You can see it clearing off the 4 and 5 and replacing it with the result, which is 20. In other words, we've after after hitting this uh, multiplication symbol here, what, what it has done is resolve this uh, calculation to the result, which is 20. Now we have 20 in the top of the stack as the only element on the stack. To do the next calculation, we can push 3 onto it and then press the plus symbol. And that's our answer. Okay, there are three things that I would like to note about reverse Polish. The first is that it gives us insight about the order of operations, as I think you will see as we go deeper into this. The second is that we actually don't need any parentheses. And to show you why, in normal infix notation, for example, 
we have the statement 3 plus 4 times 5. That's not ambiguous only because we have this concept of operator precedence where the uh, multiplication has higher precedence than 3 plus 4. Uh, now if we want to uh, do it in the other order, we want to add 3 and 4 together first, we will have to use parentheses to override that precedence. So we will write it like So how do we write both of these in reverse Polish? Well, in reverse Polish, we first do the operation that has higher precedence. So we do 4 and 5, and then multiply. And then we do the next operation, which is take the result of that and add it to 3. What about the bottom one? Well, again, we do the, the operation that has higher precedence, which in this case is adding 3 and 4 together. So we do th 3, 4 plus, and then we'll put 5 on the stack and then multiply them together. So as you can see, the evaluation of the reverse Polish is always from left to right. And depending on which operation you want to do first, you just put that in front. As, as the first operation to be done. In this case, it's this one, and in the second case, it's this one. And there's no need to use parentheses whatsoever, which is a really neat characteristic of this notation. The third thing to note about reverse Polish notation is that it can be used to represent ASTs. We won't get into that in this episode, but we will in a future episode. So it just happens that the leadcode.com, uh, my favorite code challenge website, has the reverse Polish notation challenge already written out. So I didn't even have to write it out for you. You're welcome to go to this website and uh, try out your solution. And it even has a verifier that you can run. The way they structure it, is the input that you're given is an array of tokens or a list of tokens, depending on your programming language. Each token is simply a string. Uh, the string can either be a numeric string, like one, two, or 13, or it could be one of the four basic uh, operators. And you only have to support these four, add, subtract, multiply, divide. And your job is to uh, evaluate the notation, and then come up with the answer at the end, which is going to be the number that ends up on the top of your stack after having evaluated all of these tokens. So let, let's see how an algorithm might do that. So let's take their example, which is 2, 1, plus 3 times. And each one of these is a string. You would have to somehow uh, determine whether a token is an operator or a numeric, you can figure that out. And we have a stack over here. And you're gonna have a pointer or a cursor, and you're gonna start from the left and process each token one after another. If it's a number, you're just gonna push it onto the stack like this, and then you move on to the next one. So this is a number again, so I just push it onto the stack. And now this is one is an operator. And what you do with an operator is you pop the two elements off of the stack. And then you apply the operation to get the result. And then once you have the result, you push the result back onto the stack. Then you can move on. And now we're looking at the three. So because it's a number, we push it onto the stack again. And we move on. And now this time it's an operator. So when, when it's an operator, we take the numbers out, remove them from the stack, and uh, apply the operation. And then once we get the result, we put the result back onto the stack. So that's what your algorithm has to do. So your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to implement this algorithm to evaluate computations written in the reverse Polish notation. I will present my solution in a separate video and post that in one week's time. Good luck, and uh, I'll see you next week.